This morning's reading is Romans 8, 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about by your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, especially on this day. Today is the day known in the church calendar as Trinity Sunday, when we get to ponder one of the greatest truths of the Christian trait, of the Christian faith, the mystery of our triune God, the three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thinking about God and talking about God, what he's like, is difficult. Nevertheless, it's arguably the most important thing that we can talk about. Because what we think about God shapes our whole understanding of reality, of ourselves and how we are to live. I wonder then what you think when you think about God. You might think of him in general terms as the creator. If you're a Christian here today, you may think of him as the one who comes to us in Jesus and who gives us the Holy Spirit to live inside us. The biblical account presents God not as a static unity or as an individual, but as a trinity, one being and yet a community of three persons. Now, the Trinity is a famously difficult concept, one that is beyond human capacity to understand. And indeed, it was fiercely debated in the early church. Now, today is not the day for me to give you a history lesson or a talk uh, within a series we might call Famous Fights of the Faith, Uh, on how this doctrine came to be passed down in the tradition of the church as the revelation of the scriptures. But it is there throughout the scriptures, present but hidden in the old and more fully revealed in the new. In the creation account of Genesis, we see God the creator who speaks the cosmos into being by his word and the spirit who hovers over the unformed chaos before bringing it into order. In the New Testament, in John's Gospel, Jesus is revealed as the Logos or the Word, the one who is God and who was with God in the beginning. We see the Trinity again at Jesus' baptism, as the Father declares Jesus as his beloved Son and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. Now, these may be familiar notions to you and there are a lot of things that I could say about the Trinity, which I won't say today. But what I do want to say to you is simply this. God, the Trinity, is a ring of splendour, one being, yet three persons, who love and celebrate each other's splendour. And if this is true, 
if this is what is at the heart of reality, then your greatest need, my greatest need, is to enter into that ring. And Jesus is the one who gets us in. God is a ring of splendour. Your greatest need is to be in that ring. Jesus is the one who gets you in. Many people who believe in God, if they believe in God at all, believe he is responsible for creation. But I wonder what you think God was actually doing before the world came onto the scene, before we came onto the scene. What sort of life did he have before he created the world? It was not a static unity, but a community teeming with dynamism and love. Each member of the Trinity was recognising and celebrating the splendour of the others, moving out toward each other in love, enveloping each other in recognition of each other's beauty and importance. I'm using the word splendour quite deliberately today to help us understand the biblical term we might be more familiar with, but we don't always understand the word glory. To recognise the glory or the splendour of something is to see its weight, its heaviness, its value, its truth, its beauty and to let it exercise its claim on you for your awe. In celebrating each other's awe, this does not mean that the Father, Son and the Spirit repress or deny their own worth, but their focus is embracing the worth of the other. We could even say that within the Trinity, there is even a deep humility, or at least something like it, as long as we understand what humility really is. For humility is not thinking that you have no worth. It is being realistic about your worth and the worth of others. It's not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself Less. Other-centred delight brings with it a certain freedom, a joyful self-forgetfulness that is the hallmark of humility. Listen to this quote from C.S. Lewis about human humility. Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap and took a real interest in what you said to him. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. It may be a stretch to suggest that is where God goes, but I think there's something at the heart of that, at that heart of other-centeredness, that moving out and celebrating the other, where the other becomes the focus. The nature of God's splendour is his perfect love and his moral purity. Each person in the Trinity perfectly loves each other and perfectly knows and loves the good. This ring of love and celebration of splendour is therefore the ultimate reality. Everything that is arises out of this ring, including you, including me. And that means that our greatest need is to be in that ring of love and celebration, to see and surrender to the glory, the splendour, the beauty and the importance of God. But none of us fully sees and surrenders to this beauty. Our eyes are dim. Our strength is weak. 
Even when we catch a glimpse of his splendor, we cannot and do not routinely and reliably surrender to what we see. The Old Testament was an exercise in education, showing humanity, showing God's people that each of us follows in the pattern and mistake of the first humans of the garden, resisting God's splendour through the temptation to seek our own splendour, setting ourselves up as one who, ones who determine the good for ourselves instead of recognising God as the one who is the highest good and determines the good for us. In turning in on ourselves, we turned away from God's ring of love and goodness and we were turned out. Because in the community of God's splendour, there is no place for self-centred seeking of one's own glory. And it doesn't take much for us to see what the world has become as a result. When we as humans turn in on ourselves and seek our glory and seek it from others, instead of celebrating the worth in others, we no longer flourish in our separation from the ring, we languish. So God is the ring of splendour at the heart of all reality. Our deepest need is to be in that ring. Jesus is the one who gets us in. In Jesus, the full sweetness of God's splendour is revealed and access is made possible. That full sweetness comes as he lays aside his own splendour and takes on human flesh to testify to God's nature as the one who is both loving and perfectly pure. He lives out in a human life the perfect other-centred love that is at the heart of the ring. He testifies to God whose goodness and purity rightly demand our awe and surrender and are far greater than we ever dared imagine. But he also reveals God as the tender-hearted Father who graciously forgives and restores those who confess their error in resisting his splendour. And then Jesus immerses those who repent and believe in the power of the Spirit to live a life of love, a life that is truly celebration worthy and celebrates the worth of God and others. In perfect harmony, the Father, Son and the Spirit act together to open the ring and draw us back in. The Father sends the Son to do what we could not do. Jesus is born with a clear eye to see God's splendour and the will to seek it. And his will is tested and perfected in the gymnasium of Satan. It's tempted in the desert. It's tempted all the way to the cross. It's the temptation of Jesus to allow his vision of his Father's splendour to be clouded. It's the temptation to seek his own splendour rather than receiving the glory that God the Father will give him beyond the cross. It's the temptation to abandon surrender to the will of the Father and it's tested to the very end. Jesus lays down his life in perfect surrender to the splendour of the Father, paying for our resistance to the greatness and glory of God. The glory of God that has a rightful claim to our awe. And in rising, he makes a new way, a living way. The beginning of the chapter from which our Reading was taken, Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Access to the ring of God's splendour is now available to all who are in Christ Jesus. 
We've spoken about who God is, a trinity of love and celebration for the splendor of each. We've spoken about our need to be in this ring and the way Jesus has opened it up. And at last, we come now to our reading. You'll be glad we're finally here. It's been a long lead up, but here we are. And I recommend if you've got a Bible with you, you might like to open it up. Uh, It's on page 1134, 1134, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. And we'll have the verses on the screen though as we go along. Because our passage today shows us what it's like to live inside the ring. What it's like when you return to the ring. What that life is like. Because when you return there, the flow of love and celebration moving between the Father, Son and Holy Spirit now washes over and envelopes you. In this passage, we see how God greets each one and meets us in our need and how he does that through each person in the Trinity. In verse 13, the power, the Spirit comes to give us power to put to death our sins and put on the life that is worthy of God. John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for sins, but Jesus came to baptise us with the Holy Spirit and give us the power that was previously lacking. The Spirit helps us not to just see God's splendour, but gives us what we need to live in response to that splendour as we participate with him. And put simply, this life is the same kind of life of love that is at the heart of the Trinity. A life of love turned out in love to God and others, celebrating the importance and beauty and value of every person as an image bearer of God, no matter how faint. So this life is necessarily a communal life, not a life of me and God only, but a life of love in the community of God's people, a life of goodwill and grace to all people. Verse 14 through to 16 says, We are given and led by the Holy Spirit who internalizes the truth of our belonging. He takes our fear away and reassures us that we really are on the inside. He is the spirit of adoption who gives us the impulse to call out to God, no longer as just the creator, but our Abba Father. The word Abba is difficult to translate in English. It's serious and polite intimate and familiar it's incredibly respectful and intimate all at the same time in verse 17 we learn that we will inherit along with Jesus a better world that is coming but that's not here yet we are heirs of God and heirs with Jesus In the current age, in a world that rewards the turning in on oneself instead of outward to God, those inside God's ring of love will suffer just as Jesus suffered. But real help and power is given by the Spirit to help us as we share in the sufferings of Jesus who is with us. How good it is to think and talk of God and ponder the mystery of the Trinity this Sunday. A mystery that illuminates even as it eludes our full grasp. God is a ring of splendour, three persons loving and celebrating one another in holy love. This is the heart of all reality. Our greatest need is to be in that ring. Jesus has opened the way to come in. But the opportunity to return 
is not unending to all eternity. Today is the day, if you're resisting God's splendour, to turn towards him and enter in. Today is the day, if you're kind of looking from the outside with curiosity, to step in, let the spirit draw you in to the ring of love that is waiting. Today is the day, if you're in Christ and you're already in, to, as C.S. Lewis says, come further up and further in. In Revelations 22, verse 17, the church is described as the bride of Christ. The spirit and the bride say, come. Wherever you find yourself today, in relation to the ring of God's splendour, come. Come further up and further in. Come.